What's up everyone, Alex here. Now that a brand new Final Fantasy is out, I figured I'd do the obvious thing and rank all 16 Final Fantasies. I played every single Final Fantasy released at launch in the West, including the MMOs, so I can definitely say that I've got a unique insight into this long-running series. In addition, I'm also sharing the results of the Final Fantasy rankings you voted for a few months ago, which concluded recently with the addition of Final Fantasy XVI. I'm curious to see if your own rankings skew closer to mine or the rest of the community, so post what your list looks like in the comments below. With all that out of the way, let's take a trip down memory lane and into the many worlds of Final Fantasy. We're starting off with one of the games that we never saw in the West until the release of Final Fantasy Origins on the PS1. Final Fantasy II was a groundbreaking departure from the first game in many respects. For starters, it was the first time you could have the ability to place characters in different rows. This created situations that let the developers design new and exciting challenges, as well as test how the absence of a player character would affect its storytelling. Notoriously, however, it also featured a leveling system that wasn't reliant on experience points. Instead, repeated use of weapons and spells would gain you points towards leveling up related stats. The trouble with this is that the only way to increase your HP pool was to get hit. This has since been addressed in multiple ways, but many still take to hitting themselves to bump the stat up faster. It should also be noted that Final Fantasy II marked the first appearance of Sid and Chocobos in the series. Final Fantasy II might be at the bottom of my list, but its contributions to both the series and RPGs cannot be overstated, as it paved the way for a lot of innovations that other RPGs continued to improve upon. I haven't played Final Fantasy XI since the release of the Chains of Promathia expansion in 2004, so the game's placement here is based purely on my experience back then. That said, Final Fantasy XI was my first foray into the MMO genre, and I still have fond memories of it. The constant shouting at Valkyrm Dunes just so someone could invite me to their party? The strange beliefs that the Japanese players had a leg up on our skills and strategies in the game? and the many, many weird rituals unique to it made me realize how truly unique and cool MMOs were. This was also the series' first foray into full, real-time gameplay, and this new direction is what made me want to try it out. Final Fantasy XI featured a job system that allowed you to equip a secondary job at half of the level of your main job. So for example, if you're a level 30 warrior, you'll be able to use any skills and attributes for your secondary job all the way up to level 15. It was also during this time that much of the game couldn't be soloed, meaning you had to party up with others in order to gain levels, so it was common practice to just go into a zone where a bunch of people are leveling and constantly yell your currently equipped jobs until you get invited. While I don't know how it is now, I know that many others have proclaimed it to be a cult classic amongst its loyal fanbase and with an easier learning curve compared to back in the day, it's also proof that it's a game that lives and grows, a quality that makes this type of game special in its own right. It pains me to see the very first Final Fantasy to be so low on this list, but I'd like to think that it's because there have been so many other great entries that it naturally would have had a tough time competing. And without this game, these other games wouldn't exist. Final Fantasy I had six jobs to choose from, each evolving into an advanced class partway through the game. During battle, you had to input all of your character's commands first, then a turn in battle would play out, with characters executing their actions based on their speed stats. Final Fantasy I also had multiple ways of travel, such as canoes, ships, and airships. The most memorable part of Final Fantasy 1 to me were the brooms that spoke backwards, leading to some fun easter eggs that the pixel remasters have faithfully retained. 
I'll always remember the map that I unfolded as I hurriedly opened up the NES box, as well as the epic battle I had with Chaos at the end. And what's more is that Stranger of Paradise actually expanded upon the lore of this game, which is so cool that I recommend playing that game if you have fond memories of this one. As one of the lost Final Fantasies that didn't arrive in the West until its 2006 DS release, Final Fantasy III returned the series to the job system and introduced the world to Moogles. Final Fantasy III combined the narrative style the team experimented with in Final Fantasy II with an expanded take on the job system from Final Fantasy I. This time around, you could change your jobs as opposed to being locked in for the entire journey giving us the freedom to choose an experiment with different combinations to our heart's content. I remember spending a ton of time just trying to level every job because I had so much fun experimenting and trying to find optimal party compositions. It's been a while since, but I remember taking on the Cloud of Darkness with a crazy setup that was far and away not what I would normally consider using, and managing to edge out the win in the end. Some of us old-timers know the story, but for the people who don't know, Final Fantasy XV didn't start off as a mainline Final Fantasy game. It was originally going to be directed by Tetsuya Nomura, and was originally titled Final Fantasy vs. XIII, when it was first revealed in 2006. Ten years later, the game was finally released as Final Fantasy XV under a new director, Hajime Tabata. Final Fantasy XV moved the series' combat to real-time action, allowing players to issue commands to their party members as part of their offensive. While much of the game's lore and story was relegated to DLC and multimedia projects, including a CG movie, what we did get is a tale of friends taking on the world together, not so dissimilar to the Warriors of Light from the first Final Fantasy. I still remember the first time I called upon my first summon and how its massive scale filled such a huge area that it felt overwhelming. And top that off with Ignis' penchant for finding new recipes, Prompto's easygoing outwardness with a dash of sensitivity within, and Gladiolus' unwavering loyalty to Noctis, and you've got a cast that you want to take a road trip with. Best of all is that Yoko Shimomura scored the entirety of 15 soundtrack and her takes on some of the series' classical themes are emotional and deliver something unique when compared to previous composers. Not bad for the composer of Kingdom Hearts and Guile's theme from Street Fighter. While much maligned, Final Fantasy VIII saw an evolution of Nobuo Uematsu's soundtrack, also bearing the distinction of having the first official theme sung by an artist in the series' history, Eyes on Me by Fei Wong. In fact, it ranks very high in my top five Final Fantasy soundtracks of all time. From both a mechanical and storytelling standpoint, Final Fantasy VIII decoupled stats from characters and infused them into the game's summons, called Guardian Forces. Additionally, Final Fantasy VIII turned spells into commodities, having us draw magic from our enemies to stock up on them, allowing its developers to completely remove MP meters entirely. But perhaps the one thing that Final Fantasy VIII did above all else is its ability to accurately represent its characters in full size as opposed to the inconsistent style switching in Final Fantasy VII, which still had chibi characters. Square was also able to composite these 3D polygon characters on top of more dynamic CG movies, adding a sense of dimensionality and action that added a lot to each scene. Final Fantasy V saw the series' last foray into the traditional job system established in the first Final Fantasy, and this iteration does a couple of very important things. It allows you to equip an ability you've learned from any job you have, as well as use ABP to unlock new skills. As one of the lost Final Fantasies, we didn't get Final Fantasy V until its Western release as part of the Final Fantasy anthology on the PS1. 
I remember picking this up back in the day and was in awe of how much fun and cool the job system refinements were. And unlike Final Fantasy 1 and 3, Final Fantasy V's party all have their own unique backstories and complex relationships. This, to me, felt like a blending of everything Hironobu Sakaguchi has learned from directing the previous four games. And as the final game the creator of Final Fantasy directed, it is a fitting and epic send-off that slingshot the series into an incredible renaissance for years to come. Motomo Toriyama has co-directed many Final Fantasy games, having worked on 10, 10 2, and 7 Remake, to name a few. And when you consider the work he did by injecting the job system in 10 2 with new flavor, the paradigm system in 13 starts to make a ton of sense. Final Fantasy 13's strengths lies in what many criticized the game for when it was first released, with these same criticisms winning over new fans as the years progressed. I thought it was brave for Toriyama and his team to tell a very linear story with Final Fantasy XIII, and the resulting game serves the narrative that they're trying to tell extremely well. The paradigm system is also super fun to play with, making turn-based combat fast-paced and really fun. Let's not also forget that the soundtrack was composed by the legendary Masashi Hamazu, adding to the game's synthetic nature and really lifting the believability of the world and its ensuing story. And Lightning's just a super cool protagonist, and I'm glad that we were able to see hers and everyone else's stories come to a full conclusion in Lightning Returns Final Fantasy XIII, which is a luxury that not many Final Fantasy games get. While Yasumi Matsuno is merely credited with the concept of Final Fantasy XII, you can still see much of his work's DNA here. After all, he did direct a lot of it before he left. Final Fantasy XII introduced the Gambit and license board systems, which felt very much inspired by the real-time nature of Eleven. Gambit ensured that we still had full control over our party members without having to babysit them much, though having to buy useful Gambits certainly was a strange move. The license board system took the concept of the sphere grid in 10 and applied it across the board, no pun intended, locking weapons and armor behind it as well, which was a bit controversial. But what I like most of all is the sense of scale Final Fantasy XII delivered, recalling those moments when I'd run across vast desert sand dunes and fighting massive monsters in huge temples. And while I'll agree that when you distill the story down to its core that it does feel strangely Star Wars-like, the worlds and characters it's able to introduce to me are wonderful, and have since been one of my favorite experiences in games to date. Final Fantasy IX is an interesting beast in that it ran contrary to everything the series had been building towards, and instead, utilized audiovisual technology that the company has honed over the years to deliver one of the best turn-based RPGs in the series' history, while bringing back its combat and progression systems to a simpler time. With memorable characters, classic summons, and a story that brings everything back to crystals once again, Final Fantasy IX utilized clever callbacks that took advantage of fans' nostalgia of the series, setting precedent for other Final Fantasies like 14 and 16 to do the same. Best of all is that it's the last Final Fantasy soundtrack Nobuo Uematsu fully composed, and its theme song, Melodies of Life, served as a fitting swan song as a new generation of composers prepared to leave their own mark in future games. While many consider 15 as the first Final Fantasy with real-time combat, I consider Final Fantasy 16 as the first game in the series with true real-time action combat. And while you're joined by other party members in this adventure, all you need to worry about is you. You build up your character however you want, equipping icons to fit your playstyle, and continuously optimizing your gameplay to such a degree that'll turn Clive into a meat grinder. It's also the first game in the series to be M-rated, 
being given license to push many of the series' more serious subjects even further, while still being inspired by the series' 35-year history. Just looking at a Dragoon pose in-game for the first time, and you'll see how aware its creators are of the symbology and majesty of the series. If you want to learn more about my thoughts on 16, you can watch my massive 20-minute review of the game. But what I will end with is that it'll be interesting to see where this one will eventually rank in people's lists. Which reminds me, I think this is a perfect time to reveal how you all ranked all 16 Final Fantasies. The results of this ranking is based on more than 400 votes, and I want to thank you all for participating in the poll. So let's see how your favorite Final Fantasies fared. Number 16, Final Fantasy XI plus Expansions. Number 15, Final Fantasy II. Number 14, Final Fantasy I. Number 13, Final Fantasy III. Number 12, Final Fantasy XIII. Number 11, Final Fantasy XV. Number 10, Final Fantasy V. Number 9, Final Fantasy XVI. Number 8, Final Fantasy XIV, plus expansions. Number 7, Final Fantasy VIII. Number 6, Final Fantasy XII. Number 5, Final Fantasy IV. Number 4, Final Fantasy X. Number 3, Final Fantasy VI. Number 2, Final Fantasy IX. And number 1, Final Fantasy VII. Displayed on screen, you can see how your rankings compared to mine. And don't worry, we'll get to my last 5 games very soon. But I want to ask, how did your favorite Final Fantasy rank? Post your thoughts below and join in others' conversations in the comments. And while you're doing that, let's find out how the rest of the Final Fantasies were ranked on my list, shall we? As the first SNES Final Fantasy, Final Fantasy IV broke new ground by not only creating a multi-layered story that built upon Final Fantasy II's narrative style and story progression, but also infused a lot of depth to the jobs featured in the game, thrusting players into an adventure that many consider as the most difficult Final Fantasy game ever made. While you can't change jobs, its presence in Final Fantasy IV is given more importance by incorporating it into the storytelling, leading to moments like seeing Cecil's incredible transformation into a paladin, as well as several surprise returns from characters we've met along the way. It also incorporated crystals, four powerful elemental fiends, and numerous tropes that fans have loved from previous games, and it does so with an elegance and ease that makes this game truly a masterpiece for me. Final Fantasy IV was also brave in that it had three overworld maps, and the only Final Fantasy to feature five characters in your active party. But, like I said, don't think that the extra party member will make this game easier. And with the pixel remasters, the game's difficulty has been returned to its original Japanese release. So if you're thinking about playing this game, be ready for some truly challenging times. If you're a Final Fantasy XIV player and you're hearing this song playing in the background, I'm willing to bet that the first time you heard the song, you started feeling teary-eyed and emotional. Such is the transformative power of playing a Final Fantasy game online with other fans, a shared experience that is only rivaled by its predecessor, Final Fantasy XI. And while its original release was rife with problems, A Realm Reborn, its combat story, and its subsequent expansions have given us players an amazing journey that culminated in last year's award-winning expansion, Endwalker. But it ain't over yet. To the folks who have yet to take their first steps into Eorzea, it'll appear to be just another Final Fantasy MMO. But to the rest of us Warriors of Light, it's a place we call our home, alongside a community composed of both the game's fans and its developers. It's a game that continues to celebrate and take inspiration from the decades-long history of this beloved franchise.
for me, the term theme park MMO has never been more appropriate, and Final Fantasy XIV is the only place that celebrates the magic and majesty of the series' entire history, one that continues to dazzle and enchant to this day. Many relationships and friendships have started in Final Fantasy XIV that, to many of its players, casual or hardcore, it's become a part of our lives. And whenever a new expansion is announced, there's always an influx of new and returning players ready and willing to jump into the world of Eorzea time and time again. I gotta be honest, out of all the Final Fantasies on this list, Final Fantasy VII is my least replayed. Every time I try to pop in my original PS1 disc 1 of the game, I'm immediately reminded of the quality of its localization work, which is to say, not great for its time. That's not to say, however, that Final Fantasy VII isn't one of my favorite Final Fantasies of all time, a distinction that the top five games on this list share. Whenever I hear the main theme of Final Fantasy VII, whether in the original game or in the remake, my heart swells. Uematsu created an overworld theme that had distinct highs and lows, serving as a bite-sized representation of the game's story. Final Fantasy VII introduced the Materia system, a way to commoditize the learning of magic that built upon the foundations of its predecessor. This allowed players to mix and match different combinations of Materia, allowing for an unprecedented level of customization unlike anything the series has seen before. Final Fantasy VII also had some truly memorable marketing ad campaigns in gaming history, owing much to its move to disc media. From joking that you'll be needing hundreds of cartridges to fit the entirety of the game, to showcasing its breathtaking CG movies as part of its TV commercials, Final Fantasy VII completely upped the ante when it came to RPGs of the time. This also marked the series' move towards 3D, featuring full-size 3D characters and backgrounds during combat, and chibi 3D characters and pre-rendered static 3D backgrounds during exploration. Technical innovations aside, Final Fantasy VII's soundtrack also ranks in my top five Final Fantasy soundtracks of all time, and not surprisingly, its story also ranks high as one of my favorites in series history. No wonder it's in my top five list of Final Fantasy games. Final Fantasy X starts off very differently from other Final Fantasies. It starts off in a somber note, with its piano melodies echoing in space, as we see our heroes looking forlorn. And as we continue on our journey through Spira, we quickly realize why. Final Fantasy X ventured far and away from the familiar Western motifs of previous Final Fantasies, gathering inspiration from its developers' roots in Eastern culture, creating a truly unique gameplay experience that feels like a pilgrimage. Fitting, of course, given that that's exactly what its characters are doing. This is due to the removal of a traditional world map, creating a seamless world where character sizes are accurately represented throughout the game. This forced progression, this inevitable march towards oblivion, fit the form of its narrative, that there were times that, as third-party observers, we all strongly felt as though Yuna shouldn't continue on with her journey, knowing full well what awaited her in the end. This heightened our feelings and the stakes for its characters, making us feel worried for Yuna and company, and falling ever deeply in love with the rest of the cast. This Final Fantasy also featured the first time the games were voice acted, with its fantastic voice cast delivering some truly memorable experiences that I still remember to this day. And most of all, it features my most favorite progression system in the form of the Sphere Grid, which was expanded upon in the remaster. And let's not forget how it abandoned the ATB system in favor of a really fast and snappy turn-based system, yet another deviation from the established norm. Anyone who marched onward through this Final Fantasy found a fitting conclusion, much like its heroes did, that is still, uniquely, the only Final Fantasy set completely with an Eastern aesthetic.
The way the snare drums start along with a melody of Terra's theme is a march forward, a rallying cry of sorts, embodying the values of Final Fantasy. A fitting tune to accompany my choice of Final Fantasy VI at the top of this list. Of all the 16 Final Fantasies I've played through, none have carried the same emotional gravitas in such a timeless manner as Final Fantasy VI. Final Fantasy VI to me strikes an intriguing balance of whimsy and seriousness, owing much to the work of famed localizer Ted Woosley. And while I lament the absence of his infamous Son of a Submariner line in the Pixel Remaster, much of Woosley's chosen lines still remain a part of it, indebted much to the timeless nature of the script he'd written. While many of the game's characters start off seemingly with their own job archetypes, Final Fantasy VI was also a complete departure from the rest of the series, as it allowed players to equip espers to allow every character to learn magic. But perhaps the most noteworthy quality of Final Fantasy VI is that it truly had some incredible moments, as well as scenes whose outcomes you had control over. And while the game would certainly funnel you back to its main path, the resulting outcomes still hurt at times. What people also don't know is that Final Fantasy VI is directed by two people, Yoshinori Kitase, who would go on to direct Final Fantasies VII, VIII, and X, and Hiroyuki Ito, who would go on to direct Final Fantasies IX and XII. Their combined creative insight made Final Fantasy VI such an incredibly timeless game, even when you compare it alongside other contemporary retro-style RPGs. And with the news of employees from within Square Enix wanting to remake this game, I can't even f I can't even finish that sentence. I can't imagine how amazing that could be. Needless to say, Final Fantasy VI sits atop this list easily for me, and playing through the Pixel Remaster recently only cemented my love for the game. With all that said, I think it's appropriate to take the time to acknowledge the journey we've all gone through just now. While opinions of how each Final Fantasy should be ranked is a fun exercise, it also tells us a lot about ourselves, like what things we value over another and what's truly important to us. And for some of you who have taken to the comments and shared how these stories have personally affected your lives, I can't thank you enough for having the courage to share them with us. I'll leave you with this one final thought. Regardless of where Final Fantasy is going, it is the series that has brought us all together here, and no one, not even our opinions of where the series is heading, will ever take away from the wonderful memories we've had with the games that we love.